You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the globe to bring you the latest developments in medical cannabis, adult marijuana, industrial hemp, and spiritual ganja. We love the earth. Hey! It's time for the Marijuana Agenda with Ross Belleville. Now, here's your host, Ross Belleville. Good day, tokers and tokettes and non-toking lovers of liberty. It is Monday, May 15th, 2017, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Welcome to the show and welcome to week three. This is our central rotation, so you'll be hearing some regional reports from the middle of the country this week. Stay tuned for that coming up. On the show today, we have got a visit from Dr. Mitch Earlywine in our cannabis Q&A segment. All sorts of new studies for us to tell you about, both good and bad. In our drug war data mining segment, we got a roundup of a bunch of polls from New Hampshire, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, plus data from New York City, some demographics on women toking, and some news from the NFL. Then in our Midwest Cannabis Chronicle debut, we're speaking with Dan Veets from Missouri Normal on the prospects for medical marijuana legalization in 2018 and we'll wind things up with my radical rant opinion piece legalization does not invent cars and weed a message for the governor of Vermont who is currently sitting on a legalization proposal because of his concerns about public safety and traffic following marijuana legalization that's all coming up in the first hour today on the marijuana agenda followed by Toker Talk Radio in hour two but we get things started with the Cannabis Headline News coming up next, right after this two-minute break. You're listening to The Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belleville. Looking for the 420-friendliest way to visit beautiful legal potland, Oregon? I'm Lori Duckworth, inviting you to come stay with us at Delta 9 House and Studios. You get your own private room with queen bed and access to our high-speed Wi-Fi, premium entertainment system, and more. We'll even cook you breakfast. Look us up on Facebook at Delta 9 House. That's Facebook.com slash Delta number 9 house. Delta 9 House is booked through Airbnb and licensed by the City of Portland. It's time for Cannabis Facts about teen drug use from Robert Platchorn's TheSilverTour.org. This message is supported by our donors and Hemp Inc., a public company poised to lead America's hemp revolution at HempInc.com. A recent survey by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control indicates that in states that have legalized medical marijuana, the rate of marijuana consumption among high school students has not increased. In fact, in legal states like Colorado, teen use has actually decreased significantly. It's simply no longer a big deal for teenagers in legal states. This was Cannabis Facts from the Silvertour.org, an educational nonprofit supported by our donors and Hemp Inc., a public company poised to lead America's hemp revolution at hempinc.com. You're listening to the Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belleville. I'm Russ Belleville with the Marijuana Agenda. Join me every two weeks for Police for Reform with Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Learn more at mjagenda.com slash about. This is your Cannabis Headline News, brought to you by MarijuanaMoment.net, the complete source for all your marijuana news in one morning newsletter from Marijuana Majority founder Tom Angel. Subscribe today for free at MarijuanaMoment.net. This is your Cannabis Headline News for Monday, May 15, 2017. I'm Russ Belville. As reported by Marijuana Moments' Tom Angel, many members of Congress of both parties are critical of Attorney General Sessions' move to rescind an Obama-era memo intended to reduce mass incarceration. 
Senator Rand Paul, Republican of Kentucky, said mandatory minimums have, quote, incarcerated too many minorities, which Sessions policy, quote, will accentuate. Senator Patrick Leahy, Democrat of Vermont, said, quote, this will not make us safer, quite the opposite. Senator Dick Durbin, Democrat of Illinois, said the policy, quote, flies in the face of the growing bipartisan consensus, end quote, against mass incarceration. Senator Kamala Harris, Democrat of California, said it would, quote, turn back the clock on the progress we've made, end quote. Senator Mike Lee, Republican of Utah, characterized the policy as not, quote, smart on crime, end quote, echoing earlier comments by the author of the rescinded memo, former Attorney General Eric Holder, who called the change, quote, dumb on crime, end quote. In the House, Representative Beto O'Rourke, Democrat of Texas, said Sessions would, quote, double down on failed strategy. Representative Justin Amash, Republican of Michigan called it an, quote, unjust, ineffective, and costly policy. Representative Keith Ellison, Democrat of Minnesota, called the policy, quote, utterly destructive for low-level nonviolent drug offenders. Representative Steve Cohen, Democrat of Tennessee, said the, quote, beneficiaries of these policies are often private prisons. And Representatives Eleanor Holmes Norton, Democrat of D.C., and Barbara Lee, Democrat of California, both called it an, quote, effort to revive the harshest sentences of the failed war on drugs, end quote. A congressional panel of Philippine lawmakers on Monday found an impeachment complaint against President Rodrigo Duterte lacked substance and should go no further, a widely expected outcome underlying the Maverick leader's steadfast legislative support. Committee members unanimously voted to shoot down the complaint by Gary Alejano, a member of a minority bloc, and will recommend its dismissal by the 292-seat Congress, where Duterte enjoys a supermajority. Alejano accused Duterte of high crimes and betrayal of the public trust by concealing assets, supporting summary executions of thousands of Filipinos in his war on drugs, and having a defeatist approach toward Beijing's assertiveness in the South China Sea. Iowans suffering from a range of diseases and illnesses gain access to medicinal marijuana under a bill signed into law on Friday by Iowa Governor Terry Branstad. The measure, House File 524, expands access to cannabis oil to include patients diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, cancer, multiple sclerosis, seizures, AIDS or HIV, Crohn's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, as well as most terminal illnesses that involve a life expectancy of less than one year and untreatable pain. With Branstad's signature, the law takes effect immediately, making medical marijuana available to potentially thousands more Iowans than under an existing law limited to those with epilepsy. While the newly expanded medical marijuana law in Iowa allows patients to buy the low-dose medication from in-state dispensaries starting December 2018, Iowa residents could look to Minnesota. A provision of a new bill specifically references that state as a potential source of medication and directs Iowa regulators to contract with Minnesota's two manufacturers of medical marijuana. It's the first half of an arrangement being worked out between Iowa House Speaker Linda Upmeyer and Minnesota House Speaker Kurt Doubt, friends who first explored the idea last year until the push to expand Iowa's medical marijuana law fizzled out. That arrangement could raise federal concerns. Despite its legal status in nearly 30 states, the federal government still considers medical marijuana a Schedule One drug that can't be moved across state lines. A state lawmaker on Monday is scheduled to unveil the latest piece of legislation that would legalize, regulate, and tax recreational marijuana in New Jersey, and this time he says it has a real shot of becoming law. Governor Chris Christie is staunchly against marijuana, arguing that it's a gateway drug that can lead users to try harder substances, but the senator proposing the bill noted that Christie's final term is up in January, and a new governor will be elected in November. The frontrunner is Democrat Phil Murphy, who is in favor of legalization. So are the other five Democratic candidates for governor. Republican candidates are split. This has been your Cannabis Headline News for Monday, May 15th, 2017. I'm Russ Belville. You're listening to the Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belville. At Herbie's Cannabis Seeds, we pride ourselves on bringing you the best quality seeds from the world's most respected cannabis seed producers, all at the lowest online prices. You can find Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. All cannabis seeds are sold as souvenirs and as a means of preserving cannabis genetics. Herbie's Seeds in no way intends to condone, promote, or incite the use of illegal or controlled substances. We strongly urge all prospective customers to check their national laws prior to placing an order. Herbie's Seeds at Herbie'sHeadShop.com. Proud sponsors of the Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belville. Hey, this is Willie Nelson for Norman. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. 
I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer than alcohol. There's nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting those who smoke marijuana responsibly. To learn what you can do to help, contact Normal at NORML.org or call toll-free 888-67-NORML. The Marijuana Agenda. Like the liberal agenda, but with profits. ka I'm Russ Belville from the Marijuana Agenda. Join me every Friday for the Reefer Rock Review with Herb Thrasher from 420radio.org. Learn more at mjagenda.com slash about. This is Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and author of numerous books and columns on cannabis science, culture, history, and medicine. Email your questions to Dr. Earlywine at 420research at gmail.com or call the Marijuana Agenda message line at 650-LEGAL-MJ. Now, here's your Cannabis Q&A. All right, everyone, welcome to Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. I'm Russ Belville, and of course, as always, we have Dr. Mitch Earlywine joining us by telephone from Albany, New York. Welcome, doctor. Good to be on the show. All right, there's uh, an interesting lineup of topics for us to discuss today because it's kind of good news, bad news, good news, bad news. So let's start uh, with bad news, or what might be bad news. There's this study that says uh, from... uh, uh, I believe it is Ohio State University, that legal marijuana shops are causing an increase in property crimes. Uh, what did you make of this study? There are a couple of quirks about this that I want people to be aware of when they're confronted with prohibitionists who are going to say this is somehow an argument for keeping cannabis illegal. Legal marijuana shops increase property crimes is in some ways kind of an unfair headline. If you look closely, yes, there are some property crimes in the adjacent communities around where legal marijuana shops show up. They're nothing like the violent increases in crimes associated with, say, uh, liquor stores or things along those lines. And they also tend to be co varying with lower socioeconomic status situations that I think are not properly controlled for in uh, the way these data were analyzed. So if someone wants to uh, get a legalized cannabis shop in your neighborhood, please don't shut them down with this argument because truth be told, right around, literally adjacent to the medical uh, cannabis shops and, and legal cannabis shops, is not the issue. It's just a little bit away, and it's hard to know how to interpret that until we can get a replication on this. We've had previous data suggest that this was not an issue, so I'm concerned that this may be, in a sense, a type one error, that the folks ran so many statistics, they may have found this in part by chance. I, I was wondering also, is would it be a confounding factor that when the states get around to regulating these uh, shops, that you get a bunch of uh, NIMBYs, not in my backyard folks, that uh, prevent them from being located in certain areas, and they end up in uh, more industrial or poorer areas, and maybe just the economic uh, increase in economic activity generally is is to blame for that. Sad but true, and it really isn't a, a product of cannabis so much as attitudes about cannabis that that have, have contributed to that. I, I really like the way you're wording that. Well, let's take a look at the good news now. For a long time, we've been pointing out the relationship between access to cannabis, medical cannabis, and the decrease in the use and problems with opioids. Now, finally, National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, has come around to, at least as Tom Angel reports it, uh, partially copping to that, that uh, cannabis could help uh, reduce the problem with the opioid epidemic. Is this as good a news as I think it is? 
in truth, this may be the best news we can hope from any federal agency, but for them to actually say that marijuana could curb opioid addiction, we now have some pretty compelling evidence that this really is the case, both on the state level, nationally, and from uh, surveys of individuals that uh, Philippe Lucas has published from uh, dispensaries up in, in Canada. What a surprise if you're in opiate withdrawal, cannabis really does help. And I feel like that is far and away the most compelling mechanism. But we also see at the state level, medical marijuana states are markedly less likely to show uh, opioid addiction and opiate-related deaths. And I feel like the deaths data really ought to hit home for folks. But if death doesn't matter to you, only cash does. We're also seeing uh, Medicaid spending in the medical cannabis states is also lower in part because of uh, decrease in purchase of these opiates and a few other psychiatric meds. So please, please, let's take advantage of this. And if you get the chance, uh, check out Paul Armentano's article at the normal.org website on this. And it wouldn't hurt to remind anybody in Congress that this really is the best path outside this opioid addiction problem. All right, let's get the message out to, out there. Now, back to the bad news side of today's equation. Uh, according to a report in medicaldaily.com, it says smoking marijuana while pregnant may triple the odds of premature birth and low birth weight in infants. Uh, any truth to that, Dr. Mitch? As my friend uh, Rick Grusha from the University, uh, from sorry, Washington University in St. Louis has been pointing out, there's some serious confounds here. And so, obviously, I don't want you and me ending up on a cross on the cover of People magazine, Russ. And we wouldn't recommend smoking cannabis during pregnancy because, ooh, something terrible might happen. Nevertheless, the idea that it would triple the odds of premature birth or low birth weight is probably a pretty drastic overstatement because we're talking about low socioeconomic status situations and a strange change over the years in people's willingness to admit to having used cannabis during pregnancy. So, uh, again, we're not recommending cannabis as the uh, effective <laughs> anti-nausea medication it is known as. We're just saying... Uh, odds are high, premature birth and low birth weight are probably a product of nutrition and health care and uh, prenatal vitamin consumption and things that are often associated with economics rather than something as simple as uh, consumption of a plant. Well, that dovetails into stories I've uh, reported on in other segments dealing with parenting where uh, we've reported, for example, in Alabama where they'll be uh, drug testing mothers and they find uh, THC and then take the infants away. That would lead mothers to want to uh, not go into prenatal care and, and visit their doctors. And then there you have your you know uh, lower birth weight babies because they're not getting the prenatal care because the prohibition scared them away. Is, is that a possibility? In fact, it's it's more than likely, and unfortunately here we see another thing where cannabis is blamed for an outcome that is really the product of cannabis prohibition. Mm -hmm. All right, now to my home state of Oregon, where the University of Oregon has put out a study that says legalizing cannabis here, Measure 91 in, in 2014 – did little to change student use. Uh, my first thought here was, yeah, it's University of Oregon. They are already pretty much using as much as they can. Uh, what are your thoughts being a university professor and all? Well, some of my friends at Oregon State sent me a big email with uh, capital letters, duh, and an exclamation <laughs> point. So uh, I, I got to admit that uh, cannabis uh, legislation has relatively little impact in either direction, though, I want to point out, too. So it's rather unfortunate that I do hear some pretty sad tales via email of folks who uh, are in you know legal states or medical states and who still have university cops who are really left over from the fascist era and making a big deal out of something that certainly shouldn't be treated as any worse than alcohol consumption. Yeah, and it, and if you play football for the University of Oregon, you can uh, smoke a blunt in your car and drive 115 miles an hour down the freeway and they'll let you go with a warning. So I just can't imagine the use would have gone up any. 
Uh, let's take a look at uh, some bad news. Uh, going back to the bad news side of the equation here, a story out of Mike.com. States with medical marijuana see a greater rise in illicit and problem use. And uh, what's going on in these numbers? Well, so this is a little bit confused because some of the data were gathered prior to any actual changes in legal status. So the the argument is, oh, hey, medical marijuana leads to illicit and problem use. In fact, what's probably more likely is states that happen to have a little more illicit or problematic use were more likely to pass medical marijuana laws. So we've kind of got a, a cart before the horse problem here. And then I do want to emphasize uh, essentially neither Washington nor Colorado have had any problems in teen marijuana use post-legalization, and that uh, these data really do need to be uh, interpreted with considerable caution, in part because these weren't randomly assigned. These states weren't uh, suddenly told, hey, you're going to suddenly have medical cannabis laws. They chose to have this in part because they were different, and the fact that they have uh, some problematic uh, other drug use is a correlate of that not caused by cannabis legalization. So uh, is it simple to say that, uh, too simple to say that uh, places that smoke a lot of pot legalize it rather than legalizing pot makes people smoke a lot of it? It, it perfectly put. All right. Let's wind things up here with some good news, especially for those of you with some old dumb mice. A new study shows that cannabis can reverse cognitive decline in mice and of of course, we're hoping this translates to humans, but uh, give us your lowdown on this. Well, so I, I do want to emphasize that these are what we would call micro doses and that the uh, THC is reversing cognitive decline, but only in the older mice. The young mice are showing some impairments uh, walking through those poor mazes, as you might imagine. And I, I feel like we've got enough confirming evidence in animals now. It really is time to go for the human data. So everyone who wants to be randomly assigned to use cannabis for the next 20 years, please email me. No, <laughs> I do feel like it's pretty obvious that the antioxidant effects of the cannabinoids are uh, now contributing in a way that we can see is going to protect folks from some of the cognitive declines associated with aging. But the microdosing seems to be super important. So uh, as we've said in the past, a little dabble do you. Well, that's good news considering that uh, Mickey Mouse is 88 years old. So uh, maybe we can – he's in California, <laughs> Dr. Mitch. It's perfectly legal for, for Mickey, I believe. You got it. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us again for our Cannabis Q&A. And if you've got any questions for Dr. Mitch Earlywine, you can send them in to 420research at gmail.com, and we may use them on a future episode. We can keep your name private if you wish, but uh, we can use them and, and get other people – uh, the information that you're seeking here on our cannabis Q and a Dr. Mitch, thanks so much. And we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. My hearty. Thanks. This episode was produced as part of the marijuana agenda with Russ Belleville, the daily news and interview podcast covering the world of medical cannabis, adult marijuana, industrial hemp, and spiritual ganja. Subscribe now for free at mjagenda.com. Beginner guitars and banjos are often constructed much better than ones built before your time. Why struggle? Get a new instrument or fix the old one. The trusted professionals at the Fingerboard Extension will evaluate your instrument for free. Repairs are priced for people who work for a living. Stop by the Fingerboard Extension downtown Corvallis at 120 Northwest 2nd Street today or check out its inventory on the web at fingerboardextension.com. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. 
the marijuana agenda, like the alcohol agenda. But a lot safer. I'm Russ Belleville from the Marijuana Agenda. Join me every four weeks for shark sessions from the Marijuana Show. Learn more at mjagenda.com slash about. Promoting the end of adult cannabis prohibition is easy because we have facts, science, reason, compassion, evidence, truth, and logic on our side. It's even easier when researchers catalog it all for us. Learn how to gather the facts on marijuana use, arrests, seizures, rehabs, drug tests, and more on this edition of Drug War Data Mining. Today in the Drug War Data Mines, we are going on the data mining lightning round with polls and data from all across the United States and all sorts of demographic spectrums. Let's get started. First of all, a new poll from the University of New Hampshire Survey Center has some of the strongest support anywhere for marijuana legalization. The poll found 68% supported legalization with only 27% opposed. What makes the finding even more striking is that more than half or 53% of respondents in the same poll identified drug abuse as the most serious issue facing the state. As the pollster noted, quote, the public doesn't see marijuana legalization and the opioid crisis as the same issue, end quote. A recent poll of 1,000 registered voters in Illinois by the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute found that regulating and taxing marijuana like alcohol was favored by every segment of the electorate. Overall, 66% of Illinois voters support such a step, 45% strongly. In contrast, 31% opposed the idea, only 19% strongly. Support for legalized pot ranged from 74% in Chicago and 70% in the suburbs and collar counties to 54% in the rest of the state. A majority of Pennsylvania voters support marijuana legalization, according to a poll released by Franklin and Marshall College. The survey said 56% now support marijuana legalization, a 16-point increase from the last time the question was asked in 2016. A majority of independents and Democrats, 75% and 61% respectively, support legalization, but only 44% of Republicans do, according to the poll. People of color in New York City are more likely than white people to face conviction when arrested for marijuana possession following similar arrests, according to data obtained by Politico New York from the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services. In New York City in 2016, 15.8% of marijuana possession cases involving white people ended in conviction and sentencing, while 32.3% of the cases involving black people and 30% of the cases involving Hispanic people ended in conviction. National data show that in 2010, 14% of blacks and 11.6% of whites said they had used marijuana in the previous year. And among people aged 18 to 25 years old, the greatest demographic of marijuana use, 33.4% of whites and 27.6% of blacks reported using marijuana in the past year. Massachusetts voters strongly favor judicial discretion over mandatory minimum sentencing and broadly support more aggressive reforms to the criminal justice system than are now being considered by legislators, a new Mass Inc. poll shows. By a nearly 2 to 1 margin, 53 to 27 percent, voters think Massachusetts prisons currently do more harm than good, making inmates more likely to commit new crimes rather than preventing future crime. A plurality, 42%, think there are too many people in prison in Massachusetts, while 23% say the number is appropriate. Just 10% say they are not enough. On a key issue affecting sentencing, 60% say the state's felony threshold should be raised to $1,500 from its current $250 level, while 36% oppose the change. Massachusetts has the third lowest threshold in the country and has not raised the dollar amount in decades. A new report from the Cannabis Consumers Coalition says that just as many women consume cannabis as men. 
This result is dramatically different from the other reports that usually find that men dominate the cannabis consumption crowd. CCC's survey had 53% of women consuming cannabis versus 42% for men. She noted that a headset report found that 68% of men were cannabis consumers, which puts the ratio closer to 2 to 1. However, a Gallup poll from 2013 also reported a closer gap with 8% of men and 6% of women saying they used cannabis daily. In a survey by BudTrader.com, an online medical marijuana marketplace, more than 150 current and former professional football players were asked for their experiences with various types of painkillers, including opioids and marijuana. Though marijuana is currently banned by the National Football League, 68% of the current and former players polled said they had used marijuana, either for recreational or medical purposes, during their career, while 87% said they would use it if the league allowed it, and 89% said they believed it would be an effective treatment for pain and other ailments. In the BudTracker.com survey, 91% of players said they had taken opiate-based painkillers like oxycodone, hydrocodone, and propoxyphene. Additionally, 45% of players said they had felt pressured into taking those drugs by team doctors, staff, and teammates in order to get back on the field. 68% say they had been concerned about their usage of painkillers, and 74% say they've had negative side effects from using them. This has been your Drug War Data Mining Poll Roundup. Thanks for joining us, and we'll be right back after this short break. You're listening to The Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belleville. Hey, everybody, it's Russ Belleville from The Marijuana Agenda, inviting you to be like me and get your ink done at Lucky Horseshoe Tattoo, Fort Worth's most female-friendly, clean, sterile, awesome tattoo shop. Thomas and his crew are true artists who can design you a custom piece or use a design you bring in. Lucky Horseshoe also offers all styles of tattooing as well as piercings and all-around fun. In the DFW area, stop by Lucky Horseshoe Tattoo and tell them Radical Russ sent you. Trust me, it'll feel awesome. It's time for Cannabis Facts About Alzheimer's from Robert Platshorn's TheSilverTour.org. This message is supported by our donors and Hemp Inc., a public company poised to lead America's hemp revolution at hempinc.com. A new Florida study in the journal Molecular and Cellular Neuroscience found that cannabis promotes the growth of healthy new brain tissue. It can slow the effects of Alzheimer's and may in fact be able to halt it entirely. A long-term study by Ohio State University's Professor Gary Wink concludes that people who regularly use marijuana get Alzheimer's at a much lower rate than others. This was Cannabis Facts from the Silvertour.org, an educational nonprofit supported by our donors and Hemp Inc., a public company poised to lead America's hemp revolution at hempinc.com. The Marijuana Agenda, like the pharmaceutical agenda without all the side effects, overdose deaths, you know, insurance. Side effects may include nausea, dry mouth, and constipation. Dry mouth, constipation, indigestion, and abdominal pain. Which can occur without warning and may cause death. I'm Russ Belville from the Marijuana Agenda. Join me every four weeks for the UK Cannabis Chronicle from the UK Cannabis Social Clubs. Learn more at mjagenda.com slash about. Welcome to the Midwest Cannabis Chronicle. Today, we catch you up on the latest news and speak with an expert from the great Midwestern region of America, from the Great Lakes to the Great Plains, including some of the latest states to embrace medical marijuana to the last states to resist it. Join us now to discuss hemp in the heartland with the Midwest Cannabis Chronicle. Welcome to the Midwest Cannabis Chronicle. I'm Russ Belleville. Joining us today is Dan Veets, who is the director of the Missouri affiliate of Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Russ. 
I'd be remiss in not mentioning also Dan is a longtime board member of National Normal, so also brings a national perspective to the discussion. And and uh, are you working with other groups in Missouri we should uh, give a shout out to? Oh, yeah. Sure. We've got a we've got a whole alphabet soup of groups here. We've got the Missouri Cannabis Industry Association. We've got Show Me Cannabis. We've got uh, five very active normal chapters. And, and as you mentioned, they form the Missouri Normal Affiliates. So uh, there are a lot of groups. Of course, we also work with ACLU and various other like-minded organizations. When we last left our attention on the state of Missouri, you were fighting uh, to put marijuana reform on the ballot, and it came so achingly close to making the ballot. Yeah. Give our listeners a, a, a quick uh, a remembrance of that, if they just to catch them up if they are just joining us uh, in this uh, program, on, on what happened in, in 2016. Well, we, as you say, Russ, we, we had an uh, we had a, a tremendous effort to make the ballot in November of 2016 with medical marijuana in this state. And unfortunately, the professional uh, petitioning firm that we retained, PCI Consulting out of California, which had never failed in any of its efforts, both in marijuana reform and other uh, efforts, other issues uh, in any state, including Missouri. Uh, they had never failed before, but they failed this time. <laughs> and I, I, I don't really know how to explain that yet. But the fact is that they they fell short of the required number of signatures in one out of the six congressional districts where our state constitution requires signatures to be gathered. And initially it was thought to be around 2,200 short. And then with all of the arguing we did in court, uh, we whittled it down to maybe as few as 23 signatures, but there was no way to uh, come back and add signatures. Our constitution doesn't allow a second chance. So we immediately geared up to give it another shot in 2018, and the campaign is going very, very well, and we do expect to have medical marijuana on the state ballot in Missouri in November of next year. We have 25,000 signatures in hand, and all of those have been gathered by volunteers. So we've got a great effort going. We will engage the services of a professional firm at a later point. We will make certain that we don't uh, repeat the problem we had last year. We'll have a much greater accountability for how many signatures we have in each district so that we do not fall short again. I understand the uh, the confusion lies in how the area around St. Louis was distributed as far as yeah. between county and city designations. How, explain right. that a little. Well, first, our state constitution may be unique in its requirement that we gather signatures from six of the eight congressional districts in our state. And so any signatures from the other two districts just don't count. You've got to pick six. You've got to get a, a minimum number of roughly 30,000 from each of those six districts. And we had twice the number we needed in congressional district number one, which is basically the city of St. Louis, the core of the city. Uh, but we fell short in the area around St. Louis, which has parts of three different counties in it. And it is difficult for voters or for petitioners to know with certainty which district one lives in in the St. Louis area. So that that is uh, that is uh, an issue that we have to overcome this time. The other issue I think of in criminal justice reform having to do with that area around St. Louis would be, of course, the area of Ferguson and all the unrest that yeah. occurred there. Is this in the area? Is I don't know the geography. Is Ferguson in the area where the yeah. difficulties occurred? I'm, I, yes, it is, and I'm fairly certain it's in District 2. I don't know that there was any direct impact from the unrest in Ferguson on our campaign, uh, but you're correct. Ferguson is in that second congressional district where we fell short. All right, so looking to the future then, 2018 is on site for Missouri to go for yep. a medical marijuana initiative. Tell us about the initiative right. and what the requirements would be. Well, one of the uh, things that we believe is absolutely essential to any good medical marijuana proposal or, for that matter, any, any broader legalization proposal is that individual people be permitted to cultivate for their own use. And so that is an essential part of what we are proposing, that patients in this case would be permitted to cultivate for their own use. Now, in addition to that, it would set up, of course, a system of regulation and taxation. The regulation would consist of the state licensing people to cultivate, to process, uh, and to uh, retail, to dispense at retail. Uh, medical marijuana with a doctor's recommendation, of course, basically, as in most of the other 30 states, including Colorado specifically. Now, uh, the uh, the uh, 
the plan that we uh, that we have to uh, accomplish that um, it was uh, has been uh, somewhat. So I'll say that some potential donors have been waiting to see whether the General Assembly would do our work for us. In fact, there was a bill filed to put our initiative on the ballot without us having to gather signatures. Legislature declined to, to do us that favor, uh, so and we weren't counting on it anyway. Um, the legislature, in fact, this year adjourned last Friday, and many of the legislatures across the country are adjourning around this time of the year. Well, here in Missouri, we had bills to uh, legalize hemp cultivation, bills to expand availability of CBD, bills to legalize medical marijuana, and bills to legalize adult use of marijuana, and none of them passed. And again, that's not really a shock. That's not a surprise. Our legislature has been especially recalcitrant and reluctant to take any uh, steps which could be seen as as a, a positive reform from our point of view uh, in the in the area of marijuana. Now, a few years ago, we did accomplish several legislative reforms, but there's no reason to think that's going to happen again, unfortunately. I think the legislature passed a CBD law because they hoped that would take the wind out of the sails for a real and much broader medical marijuana law. That has not happened. Uh, CBD is available in our state from only two licensed dispensaries, and there are only 50 people approved to receive it. So obviously that's not a satisfactory situation. We do intend to put medical marijuana on the ballot next November, and there's just no doubt that the voters are ready to embrace that. They may, we hope in uh, just a couple more years, they might be ready to embrace broader legalization, but that remains to be seen. It is notable in your description of the CBD law operation in Missouri that you do have in-state mm -hmm. access for the cannabidiol oil, whereas uh, most of That's the right. cannabidiol states do not have that and require people to become interstate drug traffickers to be able to get the CBD oil. So I guess that is a, a, at least one positive coming out of Missouri. It is. It is. And, and the legislature deserves credit for that. In fact, when it passed, it had uh, support from 90% of the members of the Missouri House and every single member of the Missouri Senate. Part of the reason for that is that the, the man who was then the leader of the Senate himself has a young child who suffers from uh, seizures, from intractable epilepsy. And so that, of course, was a tremendous boost to the effort for CBD, but very little indication that uh, the legislature is ready to go beyond that. So moving forward with a medical marijuana initiative in 2018 that would include a patient's right to cultivate at home would also be a breakthrough uh, recently considering most of the states that have passed medical marijuana legislation have failed to include that right. Is th that is a deal breaker for you guys? You wouldn't move forward without home cultivation? Yes. Yes, I think I can speak for certainly for the board of the campaign committee, for Show Me Cannabis, for Missouri Normal. Yes, we are unanimous in believing that that is an essential element of any acceptable medical marijuana laws to allow patient cultivation. You know, the only thing that stands between us and some kind of corporate takeover and some some price fixing is the ability of individuals to cultivate for themselves, and there's just no logical reason to prohibit that. It doesn't make any sense unless you are a uh, uh, an investor, unless your goal is to make as much money as you can off of uh, the illnesses and the suffering of medical marijuana patients, it, it makes no sense to deny them that opportunity. But of course, you know that, Russ. Well, yes, that's fantastic. It's wonderful to hear uh, that uh, you would stand by that. Are there any other ways in which the uh, proposed Missouri initiative would differ from what we know or, or, or be similar to what we know in other medical marijuana states as far as condition lists, registries, and perhaps reciprocity for other states' uh, ID cards? Well, we do have the benefit, uh, I should say we did have the benefit when we were drafting this measure of the experience of other states and, and the experience of patients from other states. And I have represented as a defense attorney many patients from other states who come through Missouri and hope and in some cases I think they believe that because it was legal for them to to purchase or grow uh, cannabis in another state that they're protected here in Missouri. And that's not that's not a far-fetched notion. There is, a, there is, after all, in our Constitution a, a provision which says that the states shall, uh, shall respect the laws of other states, but the courts have interpreted that in a narrow fashion, and they're not going to compel one state to allow a patient from another state to do 
what would be legal in his or her state <laughs> necessarily. So uh, the point is that, yes, we do have a reciprocity clause uh, in our state law. So the people who are uh, in possession, in compliance with their own state's medical marijuana law will not be subject to arrest here in Missouri. One of the other very important aspects of, of this law, which should be a part of every state's laws, is protection for uh, patients who use cannabis and who need organ transplants. And many states continue to deny organ transplants to people who test positive for cannabis. Now, that makes no sense. There is no medical or scientific basis for that. It would make more sense. Well, regardless of what would make more sense, there's no, there's no basis for that. There's no reason to believe that consuming cannabis makes a person less likely to successfully uh, receive an organ transplant. So we have also included that provision, explicit and, and very clearly stating that no one shall be denied an organ transplant because they are a cannabis patient. That is fantastic. And uh, you also mentioned uh, hoping for the future to move forward with adult use legalization. Is there perhaps a, a step in between there where Missouri uh, might pursue uh, reducing penalties or decriminalization at some level? Well, in fact, Missouri did reduce penalties. I was involved in the Missouri Bar Association Committee that rewrote and reorganized the entire Missouri criminal code, meaning all of the criminal laws in our state. And that, gosh, that's already been several years ago that we, we did that drafting work. And then we came to the legislature with this package, which was endorsed by the Prosecutors Association as well as by the Missouri Bar. And it included several positive revisions of the marijuana laws. And among them uh, was the elimination of jail as a potential penalty for first offense only. Uh, possession of our proposal was up to 35 grams, which is the misdemeanor amount in our state. Uh, the legislature cut that back to 10 grams, but nonetheless, they did keep that provision in there. So I do not believe that is decriminalization. That term decriminalization has, uh, in my understanding of it, always been defined to mean, number one, no arrest, number two, no jail as a sentence, and number three, no criminal record. Well, the Missouri law only meets one of those criteria, and only on first offense under 10 grams for that matter, but one can still be arrested, although many police officers are not arresting people these days. They can, and some still do, and unfortunately, even if you get a, a fine or uh, a type of probation that leaves you with no probate with no uh, criminal conviction um, um, it is still it is still going to be a matter of public record while you're on probation and it is technically still a criminal conviction if you pay a fine so it's not decriminalization and the answer to your question more directly I guess is yes we could further reduce the penalties for possession we could try that but I wouldn't want to invest a great deal of time and energy in that because uh, our legislature is just so uh, stuck in the past. I mean, they're just not likely to, I think, uh, go much farther. Uh, we were able to pass those changes because they were part of a, a much larger bill and frankly distracted the legislature, I think, from the marijuana provisions that were in it. You know, we also reduced the penalties for sales by one third, reduced the penalties for cultivation by one third, and eliminated, perhaps most importantly, in my opinion, eliminated what was called the prior and persistent drug offender law in Missouri. Now, that's the law that Jeff Mazansky was sentenced to serve oh, life yes, without yes. possibility of parole for marijuana offenses uh, under, and that will not happen again. To anyone charged after January 1 of this year, uh, there is no longer any prior and persistent drug offender law. So it did several good things, but again, I do not foresee the legislature going any farther. We're going to have to go to the ballot. We will be supporting Missouri as you go to the ballot in what we hope is 2018 to further reform marijuana laws. Dan Veets uh, calling us out of Columbia, Missouri. Uh, do you have any uh, websites or contact information you'd like to leave our listeners with? Yes, indeed. The most important one right now would be the campaign for medical marijuana in Missouri, and that is newapproachmissouri.com. I don't know why it's a com, but it is. Anyway, newapproachmissouri.com uh, is the place where you can go to get updates on the medical campaign and where you can go to volunteer to help gather signatures and where you can go to donate money to the campaign, the mother's milk of politics, unfortunately. Um, but yes, that's the most important one. Of course, Missouri Normal has a website under missourinormal.org. Um, and uh, um, I think those are the two that are most important. All right. Thank you, Dan Veeds, for joining us today on the Midwest Cannabis Chronicle. Thank you, Russ, very much. Have a good afternoon. You too. 
This episode was produced as part of the Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belleville, the daily news and interview podcast covering the world of medical cannabis, adult marijuana, industrial hemp, and spiritual ganja. Subscribe now for free at mjagenda.com. The Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belville is proudly sponsored by the Marijuana Business Association. The MJBA, called by NBC News, the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, is the fastest growing business association and the fastest growing industry in America. I've been working with the MJBA for years, and I personally invite you to join the MJBA. MJBA also publishes the popular MJ Headline News on Facebook and the MJNewsNetwork.com and Marijuana Channel One on YouTube. Visit MJBA.net for more details. This is Cannabis Facts from Robert Platshorn's TheSilverTour.org. Supported by our donors and Hemp Inc., poised to lead America's hemp revolution at HempInc.com. In 1937, the second most prescribed medicine, marijuana, was banned. It wasn't about marijuana. The paper, oil, and chemical industries lobbied to end hemp farming. No longer labor-intensive, an acre of hemp produced more quality paper than four acres of trees. Plastics and fibers could be produced from a plant. Hemp can even produce ten times the energy of today's ethanol. As marijuana prohibition ends, many states now allow farmers to again grow hemp. This was Cannabis Facts from the Silvertour.org, an educational nonprofit supported by our donors and Hemp Inc., a public company poised to process America's hemp crop at hempinc.com. You are listening to the Marijuana Agenda with Russ Belleville. I'm Russ Belleville with the Marijuana Agenda. Join me every four weeks for Veterans of Compassion with the Veterans Cannabis Group. Learn more at mjagenda.com slash about. Total war against public enemy public number, number one. Ten one. federal one. criminal one. penalties for the one ounce of marijuana. Marijuana is probably the most dangerous drug. Just say no. Just Legalization say no. is just another word for surrender. For surrender. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. This is not medicine. This is a cheech and chong show. Encourage yeah. people to yeah. use less drugs. Use less I drugs. Drugs. That, was, that was the point. I think we've made a mistake to leave this place. Negative reports coming out of coming out of people. Don't smoke marijuana. Smoke marijuana. I've been thinking about the possibility of us having our ninth legalized state, the state of Vermont, which uh, is moving toward a grow and give solution uh, similar to Washington, Washington, D.C., where Vermont adults would be able to cultivate two mature plants, four immature plants and possess an ounce of marijuana. However, no taxed and regulated sales system. This, of course, is a boon to every illegal weed dealer in the state of Vermont. So uh, the Illegal Weed Dealers Local 420 thanks you very much. Uh, It's always interesting to me that uh, we have these disparate ways of trying to legalize marijuana, where in New Jersey, their, uh, their legislature passed this bill that has home grow but no sales, While in New Jersey, they've proposed a bill that's likely to pass and get to the governor there who would sign it, the the new governor who's expected to be elected, uh, that legalizes sales but no home grow. Uh, It's particularly interesting in the state of Vermont given that they've got Massachusetts and Maine right nearby that will have legal sales. So in addition to being a bonus for the illegal weed dealers in Vermont, it's also a boon to the taxpayers uh, in Maine and Massachusetts who will be reaping those tax benefits of people crossing the border to buy weed. And speaking of crossing the border, those people will be doing them in automobiles, I assume, most of the time motorcycles perhaps, Uh, but the 
well, Vermont, likely bicycles. But uh, anyway, the point of this rant has to do with the concept of stoned mayhem on the freeways. The word is that the governor of Vermont, Phil Scott, uh, is considering signing this bill that has been passed by the Vermont legislature, but is holding back because he has concerns about public safety. He's worried about the possibility of increased problems in traffic, more fatalities and crashes, for example, uh, due to the legalization of marijuana. And I just have to ask one question. Why? I, I, I want to look at the statistics, first of all, in the state of Vermont, which if you look at the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, has consistently been a top five state most years for regular marijuana use. Monthly marijuana use by people age 12 and older, Vermont was second in the nation this uh, last period of data, 2013-2014, second in the nation for the most use of marijuana. And if you look at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration data, That goes all the way back to 1994, and you check out their rate of fatalities per 100,000 miles driven. That way you get a little bit of a comparison between small states like Vermont and big states like Texas, right? Urban states like uh, New York and uh, rural states like uh, uh, Utah, for example. Uh, In those ratings, last year, last year data that we have at National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, 2014, the same year that Vermont was second in the nation, for most pot use, it was second in the nation for safest roads. It was the second safest place to drive. So I don't understand why the governor is concerned about marijuana and driving when his state has plenty of marijuana use and the second safest roads. Because I fear that people like Governor Scott and and many others who have very little experience with the world of marijuana somehow believe that prohibition is working that somehow prohibition is keeping things from happening that would be bad, and if we get rid of that prohibition, bad things will occur. Somehow they believe that legalization of marijuana invents cars and weed. Well, I got news for you, Governor Scott, and anybody else that might be listening to to me. uh, uh, We've been driving. (laughs) I, I know this is the dirty little secret that A lot of people in the marijuana movement don't want to let out, but I'm here to tell you that I've been toking and driving, and I know plenty of people, the majority of people I know, have done the very same thing, have smoked marijuana and then driven. I even can attest to people smoking marijuana while driving. And I know this is shocking for people that hear it, and I know that some will tell me, hey, I had to keep quiet about this and not not give out the uh, secret, but, you know, I feel we're better off if we're just honest about this and start addressing this concern about stone driving head on. If there was going to be any problem with marijuana and driving, we'd have seen it by now. We've seen rise and fall in the rate of people consuming cannabis in this country. We don't see a corresponding rise and fall in traffic fatalities. We see in the states that have legal marijuana or medical marijuana rates that are at the national average or below for fatalities per 100,000 miles. And we've had 20 years worth of medical marijuana to compare this data to. So there's not a big issue With toking and driving, the studies show that correcting for age and gender, that drivers under the influence of THC are no more likely to be a crash risk than sober drivers. Now, this isn't to say that a newbie should spark up the bong and get on the freeway and see how well they can do on the driving exam. But what we are saying is that people that consume cannabis regularly, especially those who are medical cannabis patients, Develop a tolerance. The body develops a tolerance to the impairing effects of THC, and the mind is not impaired by cannabis in such a way as alcohol to give us a false sense of courage. People that are too high to drive know they are too high to drive and either don't drive or exhibit very, very careful tendencies when they do drive. If there'd have been a problem, we'd have seen it by now. We'd have seen massive wrecks coming out of Woodstock, for God's sake. So let's get over it. Let's just admit it. There is not a major problem with toking and driving. And what little problem there is, the police already have the tools to deal with. It's not as if no one gets pot DUIs now. 
That's all the time we got for Hour 1. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned live for Hour 2. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. Follow MJ Agenda on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, YouTube, and SoundCloud. And follow MJ Agenda Show on Twitter. Learn more at MJAgenda.com. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you're growing, you're giant, you're rolling, you're smoking. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you're giant, you're rolling, you're smoking.